Uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, tuning in, <laughs> Minds and Money Conference. Um, my name is Gianni Kovacevic. I'm in Vancouver, Canada, and I'm joined by longtime friend, uh, some 15 years, Dirk, <laughs> who's in, um, in, are you in Switzerland or Germany at this point? Currently, I'm in Switzerland, but uh, I'm commuting already quite a lot. So traveling between Switzerland and Germany is now very easy. That's excellent. And we're going to spend 20 minutes to discuss or elaborate on what I think is a very important theme for everyone that's in the mining space uh, with metals. And that is, what do the electric metals look like in a post-COVID world? And the way we're going to go back and forth with this is I'll make an introduction on, you know, which everyone is well aware of, but maybe I'll look at some of the finer points, data on how much money is going to be spent in this sector and how that's pivoting. And then Dirk is going to give you a very unique perspective from, an, from a German industrialist or from a German technologist or from German innovation, you wouldn't say pan-European sort of strategy on how this is evolving. So if you want to just give a brief introduction, Dirk, of yourself and your experience, particularly with some of the families that you've worked with in Germany over the past years, just make it about a minute, but very brief, but, uh, but concise. Thanks a lot, Johnny. Thanks a lot. Um, I'm dealing with the lithium industry since uh, 2010. I've worked before in the um, African uh, banking and digital banking industry and have set up a, a banking group there. And already at that time, I was working with, with some of the largest uh, family offices in, in Germany. And amongst them was, for example, the, the Quant family. And uh, when I entered the space with, uh, with lithium in, in 2010, it was an evolving topic, of course. Uh, it was the first time that Elon Musk mentioned uh, he wants to he wants to get into uh, selling hundreds of thousands of Model S, and um, I sticked to this topic for many many years. So I'm dealing with it now for ten years, and I'm currently the executive chairman of Rocktech Lithium. And since 2016, we are dealing is extensively with the German car industry and the European environment uh, on different lithium products and the battery cell development. Excellent. And the Quant family, for those that don't know, they're the, the majority shareholder of BMW. Uh, out of Munich, Germany. So the, the, to, to augment the title, I think it's important to, um, to appreciate electrification. So I have a background in electrical studies. So I understand fundamentally, if you cut all these things in half, how do they actually work? Most people don't have this appreciation. And the, the enabler, the great enabler of electrification, of course, as everyone knows, is, is copper. But looking at all the little areas and all the, all the details where copper uh, is facilitated and, and utilized, it's always hidden in a motor, in a transformer, uh, in a conductor or an insulator. You actually do not see the copper. So I think that for most of society, they, they have maybe a, a polite way of saying this is an ignorance to how much copper is used. And particularly, even sophisticated investors, when I go and I we start talking about these themes, an hour and a half later, as they peel back the onions, they say, wow, that's incredible. So I've been giving these talks on the future of energy for, for many years. People that have seen me before probably think it's a broken record. And I know that it's been a next year's investment dollar scenario. I'm speaking about copper. While we have seen a mania in cobalt, we've seen a mania in lithium, lithium ion batteries technology. And of course, everyone has seen the share price of Tesla and now Nikola that's went public. Um, I will submit to most people that they don't understand the, the business case of Tesla. It's making cars is a red herring. They are a, a, an incumbent energy disruption company. If you really fundamentally understand what the, that corporation provides to the consumer and to industry, they disintermediate almost every existing system, including power systems, because you can enable your own power system. Of course, I'm talking about um, having wind and solar augmented by batteries, which you can capture during the day and use at night. Uh, you can even make cars with solar panels and with this energy. The petroleum industry is required make, basically for the vulcanization of tires and, and rubber and things like that. And I think when, when you come to grips with just how many hundreds of millions of electric vehicles will be built, um, then you start to appreciate it's, it's a no-brainer. As Warren Buffett used to say, when, it, when it's so obvious, the conclusion you know, you don't even have to bring out a pencil and paper because, you know, in the longer run, in the next five to 10 years, the, the, the a lithium demand is going to increase by some tenfold 
Now, if it happens in 13 years, I don't care. It's a tremendous amount of demand. And with copper, the, the CAGR growth rate has traditionally been since the year 1900. It's went up slightly above um, the pace of human progress. So it's about 3% CAGR over that period. And um, we can paint, paint a picture where you can see, in my view, because electrification, according to Royal Dutch Shell, is going to go from today, it's about 20% of final energy usage is, uh, is electrification. And that's going to climb in the next 30 years to 50%, 50%. So it seems, oh, it's only cl climbing by 30%. But you understand how much copper has been installed in the world to give us the systems that we have today. That, but that climbing like that, and this is going to be very deluxe power systems, uh, onshore, offshore wind, solar, batteries, and the, the charging networks and the infrastructure to enable all these systems to interconnect to themselves. Only two ways to do it. We're going to do it with aluminum and copper and predominantly copper. There's no substitute because of its superior conductivity. Um, so let's talk a little bit about um, the lithium business and we'll, we'll go back and forth. So Dirk, you, you, we, we had a conversation and this is how this was spawned. Europe does not have the ability to refine to battery grade chemicals for these batteries. So Germany, like everyone else, is beholden to the Asian economies, predominantly China. What's going on in Germany right now with, to address this? This, this is indeed a, a very, very interesting question. I, I can tell you, when I, when I restarted the lithium business in 2016, I was talking to all of the German uh, OEMs as the car manufacturers. All of them told, said to me at that time, um, better stop it, we will never build electric vehicles. So that was the first step. Uh, one year later, when it was very obvious because uh, the Chinese um, were building the electric vehicles markets and China is, is the largest market, of course, for the European car makers and especially for the Germans, not only in terms of sales, but also in terms of um, in terms of uh, profitability. So um, a year later in 2017, um, the Germans uh, started then to look at the topic and, and to, to take this much more serious. There were some quite some management changes at that time, right? And at that time, um, everyone said to me, look, the battery cell is a commodity. Uh, we are just working then uh, eventually on, on packaging the, the, the battery cells uh, and eventually to have the, the right uh, design for, for our car. Yeah, That was the focus. And that was the time you mentioned Tesla already. Yeah? Um, in my point of view, probably 40% or so of the market cap of Tesla is their supremacy in dealing with battery cell production and understanding this. Yeah, Because over the past years, uh, the Germans understood eventually that range is important, that it is important how fast you charge your battery and that this cannot be done with, with most of the standard batteries. So you, you want to have this knowledge in, in your in-house. And uh, like in Germany, last, uh, last uh, March, uh, there was an initiative started um, by our German Minister of Economics, um, Peter Altmaier, and he, he arranged together with the European Union to set up a sort of battery cell uh, subsidies program. And uh, the result of this is that we currently have an announcement of, of uh, setting up six uh, large battery cell uh, factories in Germany. So it's very clear BW is, is involved in this, uh, BMW is, is, is buying uh, many, many battery cells from this. It's very clear that the picture changed dramatically uh, into the direction that battery cells are, of course, not a com commodity, but a very, very important know-how that needs to be in-house. So the next step towards the battery metals, but this is and very, very much a European and typical German thing, I can even say. The Germans are always saying, we don't need raw materials. Yeah, You, you know, there's uh, there's roughly one, one mine left in, in, in Germany, uh, which is a smaller but interesting operation, but that's it. And the Germans are saying raw materials are available on the world markets. And uh, Johnny, as you said, uh, we have these high growth rates. So there's a, quite quite a question if we will really see all the lithium uh, hydroxide, lithium carbonate or, or copper or, or pure nickel products that are eventually needed to build these battery cells in, in, uh, in Germany. And this is a topic that is most likely, so the discussions around this start now, but most likely this will be a topic that is coming up in the next six to nine months. Um, the raw materials and the battery chemicals needed for the battery cell production. Yeah, absolutely. There's an old saying in commodity trading, commodity speculating, commodity consumption. Running out of a commodity doesn't matter until it matters, and then it matters a lot. We've seen a shortage, and when you have this, you see these, these completely parabolic moves, which usually are short-lived. Um, but what I've been saying is that you have a, a 
a, a disruption of all the, the old rule book of how things work. And the dominant commodity in the world market, of course, is crude oil. And we're now asking the question, have we already achieved peak oil demand? And I, I will submit to people that I think we might have. You, you can't, with what happened in COVID and the shutdown of the global economy, they, there's been a few things, a few revelations. One, they can see the mountains in certain cities. The air has cleaned up. It's without question, and I'm not talking about bumper sticker issues like climate change. I'm talking about particulate pollution in the city, you know, breathing easy. So we know that, that that's what the society wants, and that's where governments are pivoting. Um, the IEA and Fatih Birol came up with a report last week talking about super stimulus in moving renewable energy forward. Traditionally, over the past sort of 10 years, the, the global, global industry and uh, governments have invested about $250 billion a year. I think the peak year was $300 billion, and that's come off recently. They're saying now that to get this stimulus going, which is happening, we should be investing part of a plan to put people to work. This is about jobs. And the collateral benefit is the renewable energy acceleration. $1 trillion a year for the next 10 years, $10 trillion. When you look at the details, overwhelmingly, there's going to be a tremendous um, support for all of those products. Business is going to be good. If you're in the business of making cables, transformers, motors, you're going to be selling lots of them. You're going to be buying lots of copper products, and you're going to be able to afford to pay more for that copper. And then because of this uh, strong demand, all of these old rule books are going to break down. We've already seen the, the oil to gold ratio has broken. It used to take 16 to 20 barrels of oil to buy one ounce of gold. And that worked for 30 or 40 years. Today, as we speak, it's around 43, 44 barrels of oil to buy one ounce of gold. And just recently, it was 80. I don't see that coming back together, uh, certainly not um, because of fundamentals, only because of politics. If you get sensitivity in certain oil-producing regions, of course, for a short period of time, meaning a few years, you can have a high oil price. But nobody in the world has any interest in that. So it's also going to break down in the copper to oil ratio. Meaning if you look at a graph over the, the last 20 or 30 years, I've showed this many times in my presentation, they kind of mirror each other. That's starting to decouple. And I believe because of engineering, not because of anything else, we, we, there's low grade deposits that is all, all we have left in the copper world. You're going to have, because of engineering, copper will surpass its old all time high. That's because we have to enable 0.3% copper grades at 4,000 meters with no infrastructure and no water. You must pay for this. And it's possible we have the copper resources we just can't convert them to reserves unless you have this price. So the question is, if, like my speculation, copper goes back to four, four and a half dollars a pound, are you going to see oil at one hundred and forty dollars a barrel to keep that old ratio together? Maybe because of politics, not because of fundamentals. But in the longer run, that will definitively decouple. So let's go back into lithium mm -hmm. pricing market. We've had a lithium 1.0 boom before. Then we recently had the lithium 2.0 boom. In this next decade, is it a reasonable forecast that we're going to see a lithium 3.0 boom? What's your view, Dirk? Oh, there's, there's no doubt about this. Yeah. Um, look, uh, currently we have we have a market where uh, demand and and supply are very much in an equilibrium. Um, it is a small market compared to, to copper, so never forget this. We have a few dominant market players in, in this. And currently we have a very interesting situation because the electric car markets is growing significantly. And all the statistics also currently after COVID-19, yeah, it was it was unclear how, how the sales of new cars are being um, are going to develop. And it is very clear now that um, electric vehicle sales are not significantly hit. So all the new car sales are now um, really pushing in e-mobility. And this is supported, of course, by all the subsidies that especially the German and, and, the, and the French uh, governments are giving out, that the Chinese are also doing so. So in Germany, when, when you're buying an electric car, you get 9,000 euro subsidies. So you buy one of the smaller ones or even the VW ID3, let's say for 30,000, you, you, you get 9,000 subsidies, you pay 20,000. So there's a huge demand for battery cells and then for lithium chemicals um, for this. But uh, also due to COVID-19, the large players um, have decided more or less to stop most of the expansion work. And uh, the past years have shown how difficult and time consuming an expansion in the lithium industry is. And uh, there's now suddenly 
what I consider to be a huge opportunity for developers to jump into this space. Yeah, um, when when you are when you are courageous enough and you see this and you believe in the future of e-mobility and the future of battery storage, for example, for grid networks, yeah, then then you get into this. And we are we are convinced. I am very much convinced that we need uh, also as a, as a consequence of COVID-19, um, there's a regionalization now of supply chains. We don't have this worldwide um, and, uh, traffic and, and trade um, anymore in that in that big um, 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 volume. It will yeah. change. Um, companies will try to get more and more products uh, sourced locally, regionally. And for the lithium industry, for example, it means uh, you get your feedstock, uh, like, like our project in, in Canada, it's the Great Lakes. We get our feedstock, the lithium concentrate from there, but then we, we, we ship it uh, to, to Germany or to Europe. We build a converter in uh, Germany and deliver then the lithium carbonate and the lithium hydroxide directly to the battery cell uh, developers in Germany, to the battery cell producers and, in Germany. And these converters are and, what and the Chinese have, correct? That's, that, that's their dominant position, is the converters that they have, correct? What does it cost exactly. to build a converter? What's, gonna, what's it going to cost to build one in Germany? It, um, it, it, it depends very much on, on, on the size you're setting up, yeah? But let's keep it simple. Currently, the world market for, for lithium chemical products will be in 2020 around 300,000 tons uh, per year. Uh, so if you build a converter of 20,000 uh, tons, right, um, it, the investment will be around 350 million euros. There are many question marks around this, but this is eventually... But small money in the context of enabling a whole industry in Germany, which has a GDP of right. five, five trillion dollars, they have to have this. They could build a second and a third, even if they need it, correct? We are, we are talking about hundreds of billions of, of dollars here in, in Germany that are being put into e-mobility, right? And uh, the battery cell factories is, is, is a cost like like 10 times that much. And we need a loan for the German market. Look, with, with one converter like this, you can probably produce um, uh, enough lithium, let's say, for 400,000, 500,000 cars to really put this into perspective, right? But yeah. we are talking about 5 million electric cars yeah. uh, in Europe, probably in five years. So you need... You need a minimum 10, 12 of these kind of converters, so which is alone a four to five billion investments in Europe. And uh, you will have the same investment amount in China and then also in North America. I, I encourage everyone listening to go to RockTech's website, look at their management team and their advisors. They are different than all other lithium companies. They are surrounded by, like I said, automotive executives, politicians, and academics at universities to prove the prove that it works they're not arguing with the customer right that's what i found so fascinating by the way you guys have built your company you're actually building it with the people that can get you across the finish line and i think also looking at the three types of lithium deposits everyone is uh, familiar with the solars of south america and the hard rock projects which are predominantly in australia and like you have in ontario and in, in, in quebec but there's also direct lithium extraction where you're able to strip the lithium right out of briny water. We got about two and a half, three minutes left to go, Dirk. But you, you guys are focusing obviously on hard rock, but this investment, th these mining companies are gonna be able to make partnerships with all these different converter plants that are gonna be built in Europe and elsewhere. And that's exactly where you guys are going, correct? With your hard rock deposit, correct? Right. Okay, excellent. Um, so just to wrap up here, we got about uh, two minutes to go. Um, I think that we have to look at, um, the, the, all these different commodities, of course, are, are different and they have a different sort of um, uh, trajectory. And when you look at the European Union and how much money, and I think it's, it's, it's safe to say that there's going to be two or three trillion dollars of stimulus coming from the European continent. The United States will also be two or three trillion dollars and China is going to be some one or two trillion dollars. So we're talking about 10 trillion dollars of super stimulus. The IEA is suggesting that many of these governments and, and, and industry is going to pivot towards renewable energy schemes. And I think the mining industry has a tremendous opportunity here. And it's it's almost like you 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 you, you can't stop it. There's there's because business is going to be good for all of those industries, and it's inevitably going to trickle down to the people that provide these projects. Um, so do you have any a final note there, Dirk, on our last uh, last minute here, just to suggest to the audience? Well, um, um, first of all, thanks to, thanks to everyone for listening. And then I can only say um, this battery uh, world is, is, is a revolution. 
um, and people don't see it. it, it it's the same that, that we have seen with mobile phones at the beginning. Yeah? Uh, people, people looked at this and said, ah, I'm not sure if this will come. Um, it is going to come. As the gross rates of all battery metals are huge. Yeah? And yeah. Uh, most likely now is the time to invest into this because in, in one year time, the next one uh, will latest uh, have been started. Yeah. And you mentioned subsidies before, because some people bristle at the fact that you're getting a subsidy for a car. But if you aggregate all the subsidies globally for the entire fossil fuel industry and for the renewable energy industry, it's a it's a for, for every two dollars of subsidy that the fossil fuel industry obtains, there's one dollar for renewable energy. They they're both subsidized. People just have to understand yeah. that. And so. That's your tax dollars, I know, but uh, it's something that is going to get addressed. And I think you're going to see a big pivot where in the future it's going to go the other way, where you're going to have two dollars of subsidy for renewables and one dollar for fossil fuels. Um, on that note, I wish everyone happy investing. Thanks for joining me, Dirk. And I hope to see you very soon at a, you. in live, in person. <laughs> Take care. Bye. Thank you.